Very warm welcome back to our symposium um, after this inspiring keynote from Beth Novak on smart citizens, crowd intelligence, and I already saw some interesting points for our discussion. It's now our pleasure to kick off the second workshop of our symposium where we want to explore with you the trends, challenges, and future perspectives of intersectoral collaboration in the context of smart cities. So we want to especially focus on government business, but also government science, government, science, government um, civil society collaboration. I'm Gerd Hammerschmidt, professor and director of the Center for Digital Governance at the Hertie School, and I will moderate this session today with Evelyn Bree from the Technologie Stiftung um, Berlin, who you can also see right on my side. Let me start with a short introduction of our workshop, some organizational information. Directly move into the discussion because we have really great um, experts again joining for this session. Smart city strategies are often planned um, by the city administration, but as we all know, implementation is strongly dependent on actors from the private sector, science, or civil society. And these sectors, when aligned and focusing on shared values, such as digital sovereignty, um, um, and common goods, sustainability, um, um, resilience, are able to join um, um, to enhance, cooperate, and design and implement new, innovative, co-created solutions in order to create public value for all the citizens in the city. So that's the, the, the claim we often have in the, in the literature and also in the strategies. We, however, also know that the reality often looks quite different. We observe um, that policymakers and government officials frequently struggle with government business collaboration. Um, um, that the, that a lot of challenges in how to make such um, 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 intersectoral collaboration work in a sustainable way towards improving the public good. It raises a number of questions like does this collaboration, does collaboration offer a sustainable business model for private companies? Um, um, how can civic organizations be incentivized and compensated for sub supporting the development of projects? How can businesses and government collaborate in ways that preserves a city's digital sovereignty? So this digital sovereignty topic we hope to touch today. Uh, or how can we build trust among the partners and avoid power, resource, or knowledge asymmetries, which we also know quite well from, from research that they are quite relevant. These are just some of the topics and questions discuss with you and our panelists today in our workshop and we hope to get interesting stimulating insights from this discussion and to the panel, panel, uh, panelists and i would now like to ask all of you to join the stage it's I'm really thankful and proud for having today a really impressive panel of leading academics and practitioners on the topic of smart cities and intersectoral collaboration. For the moment, we have some background noise. would we'll ask you to mute your uh, microphones, but it's great to see you already here with us. Let me shortly introduce um, to our audience, the panelists, and I apologize for being very, or uh, having to be very short on this. I mean, we really want to use the time of this workshop more for the discussion and not a lengthy introduction of our panelists. Um, just let me start. Um, um, do we have everybody here with us? Okay, not all of them are already here. Mayin is not here. Okay, now he's here. Let's start um, on the top right. Um, it's very great um, to welcome Mayin Janssen, full professor of ICT and governance of Delft University of Technology, and one of the leading scholars on digital government. Um, he's co-editor in, in chief, uh, co-editor in chief of Government Information Quarterly, the leading journal in the field, and has also published widely on smart city strategies. Very warm welcome, Mayin. Great that you're joining us today. The next, and I just now will pass, um, um, as I see the, the, the panelists with us, Ferdinand Schuster. He's somehow um, a representative of our Berlin community. Um, Ferdinand Schuster is executive director of the Institute for the Öffentliche Sektor, which is located in Berlin and dedicated to the improvement of public sector governance and government modernization. And I will continue with um, Cécile Maisonneuf. Um, so we have a French guest joining us today, uh, which is also fantastic. Um, Cécile is, just, um, is, is chairman of La Fabrique de la Cité, a French think tank in Paris dedicated to urban innovation and prospective. Very glad that you are here with us today, Cécile. Um, I go further with Ralph Martin Zoe, 
who is joining us from Estonia. He's founding director of Fin as Twins, which is a cross-border smart city center of excellence, working on smart city development in both Estonia and Finland. So really um, cross-country collaboration. And his main role has been to initiate, implement smart city pilots jointly with different European university, uh, un European cities. And he's Research at Taltec University um, in Estonia. We have Francesc um, Pardo Bosch joining us from Spain. Um, Francesc um, is professor at the Universitat Politecnica. Uh, de Catalonia, and he has been contributing um, to, to many um, leading age 2020 EU research projects related to smart cities and sustainability, published widely on smart cities. And I mean, he has done a lot of research on Barcelona, and we all know Barcelona has become a kind of a lighthouse for many of us on, um, on, on smart city development. Um, the next in the round is Sven Ripsas. Very warm welcome. Sven Ripsas is professor um, for entrepreneurship at the Berlin School of Economics and, Local, um, uh, and Law. He's involved in many research projects on innovation, startups, entrepreneurship in Berlin, and, member, and also member of the advisory board of the Berlin Smart City Strategy Development. So he will also bring in the more Berlin perspective into our discussion today. We then have, um, and we will welcome Eyal, Yanif um, from Israel. He's professor for entrepreneurship at the School of Business Administration at Bar Ilan University in Tel Aviv. Very well, welcome. Great that you're here with us. And I'm just looking if we have some more. Um, um, can I shortly check if, um, especially our first speaker, Margarita Again Lidu, are you here with us? Doesn't look like, okay, so we are still missing um, one person. Let me check if somebody else is missing. Okay, we have Kühn Verhurst, who also should be here with us. Okay, we yes, start as it is. He just joined us. Okay. Warm welcome to all of you. I mean, it's really great that we have this very international, very diverse um, um, panel, and it's fantastic that you're here with us to share your research experiences and insights how governments, business, civil society, and research can successfully collaborate in order to create public value um, for the cities, for all citizens of a of a of a city. So this is really what we want to discuss with you, what we want to dis um, um, explore with you. Before we now start with our panelists, I just wanted to shortly introduce what we plan for this workshop and share some organizational information, especially for the ones for, for whom this is the first workshop. Some of you already have been at the first one, but for the ones of you who are new, um, some organizational information. On the right side of your screen, you can find the session chat, event chat, polls, and list of all attendees. Um, and you can move between these different kind of options. Um, we have all organized a moderated session, which means that only the speakers, invited guests, and moderators are sharing their audio and video. All, all of all of the other um, audience, you can and you are very much welcome to contribute questions, comments to the chat. So we will closely observe the chat and we'll also bring in questions from the chat into our discussion and exchange. So we want to have a very interactive thing um, and, and also involving the audience. We will now start um, the workshop with a short introductory presentations by five of our panelists to have some first insights on the topic of our workshop. And we will then have a tour de table with the remaining, the other um, panelists somehow contributing. What do they think on these first income state and, and, and introductory statements, additional points we are missing. So we. We by that should start to go into a discussion in a more interactive format. And that we want them to move really towards a broadly moderated discussion among the panelists and where we also want to involve all of the audience and all the, the, the comments from the chat and hopefully have a really a rich, engaged discussion. And we want to especially focus on what do we see as the key trends on intersectoral collaboration? What do we see as the key challenges? What are cities facing with regarding to um, um, successful, sustainable intersectoral collaboration? And which recommendations can we suggest to overcome these challenge, challenges? And this is already going into the direction of the city of Berlin. What somehow, what insights would we like to share and, and, and give us come high as recommendations for the city? for their new smart city strategy. 
Thank okay, you. and we have... Oh, and sorry, Gerard, do you want me to, to move on with the short presentations? Um, yep, we could do so. Perfect. So uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, as uh, Gerald already mentioned, I'm uh, an I'm open data researcher at the City Lab Berlin. Uh, so how we're going to proceed uh, for the presentations? So we're going to have a timer. Everyone has uh, more or less eight minutes. After seven minutes, we're going to hear a sound saying uh, you have one minute to conclude. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Marianne Jensen. Uh, as uh, Gerard mentioned, Professor Jensen holds a chair in Information and Communication Technology and Governance at the Delft University of Technology. It's a pleasure to have uh, you with us. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me uh, over here. Well, I have a lot of experience during my uh, professorship at uh, Delft University of Technology, but all kinds of forms of collaboration with cities and governments and uh, those kinds of things. So it can range from a full uh, collaboration in which both governments, industries and citizens uh, are involved, so the complete uh, uh, model, but it can also be bilateral between the universities and uh, the governments. It can also be only that the university is doing research and then afterwards we will bring it uh, to the government or to the city, so you yeah, have various forms. So, as a start, I want to ask you, what are your experience with that? We prepared a poll when it's right uh, for this. So I want to ask you to, uh, to go to the poll. I don't know how it uh, can be activated to activate uh, the poll and share our experiences, uh, your experiences with us. Would that be possible? So do you collaborate in innovation partnership with other types of organizations? Yes, government, business, science, citizens work together. Yes, only government, business and science work together. Yes, government and science work together. Yes, government and business work together. Yes, science and business work together or no. Please let me know. Please fill it in. You can go to the polls and then select the one. Yeah. Maybe for the task, that's, that's the third question we have in our poll. So later on, you also can um, um, answer the first two poll questions. But for the moment, what Mayan is especially interested, that's the third question. Do you collaborate in innovation partnerships with other types of organizations? What I already can see is quite the diversity of uh, what you're doing. And most of you work together in government, business, science and citizens work. And that's quite funny. Because I work to also try to work together in those kinds of uh, construction, <laughs> and we always have problems with getting citizens on the table. Citizens are the most difficult to get on the table because who are the citizens? Huh? Do you need the ombudsman who can represent uh, citizens? Do you need an NGO representing citizens? Do you want to have all? the citizens of your municipality uh, on the table, they're quite uh, complicated to get them on the table. So often our attention is to have all on the table, but we are not able to succeed uh, with that. When I may uh, go on with uh, the university uh, uh, partnership with others, well, why are people are doing it? You have to look at the motivations with that. Well, often what governments and companies want, they want to have access to cutting edge technology and knowledge with that. And what they don't want to do is having large investments in the technology because their, uh, their amount of budget is uh, limited uh, with that. Well, they want to have access to creative and innovative uh, ID and they want to know what is in it uh, for it. That's often the reasons for collaborating from the company uh, uh, side and the government uh, side. Of the, what does universities uh, uh, want? Well, universities are completely different uh, type of things. They often have the obligation to have valorization, to, so to work with governments together. But what they want to do is, of course, research. It's one of their core uh, business. They have a complete other type of agenda with that. Well, they also want to collaborate maybe because they have students and the companies are potential employers uh, for that. They want maybe have patents because patents can generate revenue in the future with that or intellectual property uh, rights in one way uh, or, or another. So you look at different ways of uh, looking uh, in those kinds of uh, collaborations uh, uh, with that. And what happens with those collaborations? They often fail. 
I'm sorry, I've seen many of them and they're partly successful uh, only because the ambitions are not all set or we have conflicts of interest at the end uh, of the one party goes their own way of there was a lack of expertise at the end uh, for that or we just focus on some of the incidents uh, uh, that we have having having that so it's quite hard to innovate uh, uh, together and what makes it especially hard for innovation is for the government is that it's hard to innovate in the government one of the reasons why the government often want to work together with us is that they want to go outside the government, outside their own organization. They want to have an other views on it because they have all kinds of pet dependencies and the pet dependencies block uh, what is possible uh, for them. So they want to mobilize also an external uh, view and all kinds of academic uh, expertise. What they also all, also want is to have their own employees and their own civil servants involved in all kinds of things. What they often do is a kind of design sprints in which uh, the, uh, uh, all kinds of parties are involved, including the citizens, uh, including the civil servants and including uh, software companies, and then works on something together within two till five days. It's never longer than five days what we do. And we ensure that we have working uh, software at the end. Also, science is involved. Why? Because the independent uh, view, and it can be have in all kinds result in all kinds of innovations uh, for that. Uh, sometimes we uh, build a role playing game. Why? To have all the people also that they can play it afterwards. They, they understand the problems of the citizens. So we mimic what's going on in reality, and they can experience what's going on. Sometimes you have a nice prototype that can be used to visualize what, what is uh, going on. Sometimes you build a dashboard for uh, viewing it. So you have all kinds of possibilities uh, outcome with that, but it needs to be tangible within a short time, very close uh, to the market, very close to the practice, practice with that and visible and have quick uh, gains uh, uh, for that. That's what we often uh, do in those kinds of uh, situation. Sometimes they have a long-term view and that's exceptional because often the organization wants to have answers tomorrow, eh? not today, uh, tomorrow, but not next week or next month or next year, because that's a too long term uh, view on that. There are exceptions and those exceptions, then they are happy to support some kind of PhD uh, candidate. And what I always say is, is if you have a certain team, for example, we now have the digital identity team, eh? self-sovereign identity is a hot topic uh, for that. Well, if you want to address that team, you need also fundamental research. That means you need to have those short-term design sprints for ensuring that you can show uh, something, but also the long-term, and you need some kind of PhD candidate uh, connecting it uh, to practice. So you need to combine it uh, together and i think that's also one of the critical uh, success uh, factors and this is what i can tell wonderful mayan that was a really great start into the discussion sorry for about the gong but we really tried to discipline a little bit so that we have really the maximum of everybody in the balanced discussion but thanks for this great um, starting um, 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 statement. Um, I'm now glad and I just realized I forgot to introduce one of our guests, which is Kuhn Verhoest, who is here also with us. Um, she's professor in public administration at the University of Antwerp. And she has done a lot of um, research focuses on collaboration, innovation, regulation, and trust. And he's currently leading a research project on intersectoral collaboration and how that um, affects innovation. So. Perfect that you're here with us, Kuhn. Glad that you're here with us. And now I'm also very happy that Margarita has joined us now. In the meanwhile, we were missing her. We wanted to start with her presentation. Margarita is um, a senior project manager at QPlan International in the area of urban and regional innovation. And she's done her PhD on smart cities. She has published widely on smart cities and has been working on many smart city projects um, throughout Europe over the last 15 years. And what I think is most interesting, she has been, she has conducted as part of an EU research project, a very recent um, empirical foresight research on what are the emerging trends of smart cities in Europe. And Margrethe, I think you can, you will join us without, uh, you will share with us now some key findings of that. And I think that also is a good starting point and uh, provides us a lot of um, insights into the topic today. Do you want to share the slides or should I do that? 
At the moment, you're still muted. Uh, you're still unmuted. You would have in the in the bottom of your screen the microphone signal. And if it does, this does not work, um, the suggestion would be to leave it and come back. And then normally it works. We saw it in the previous um, workshop quite well. Margarita, uh, I see that your icon, yeah, is 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 the issue is with hopping, I think, and not necessarily your computer because you are muted on hopping. Okay, these are the trick. Yeah, <laughs> these are the realities of life. The realities of digital collaboration. Do you want, I think maybe the, the best thing to do would be perhaps to move on to Cécile Maisonneuve and yeah. then Margarita as soon as uh, the issue is up on your side, perhaps if you can try to go out and go back in. Okay, perfect. perfect. Okay. Great. Okay. So okay. we have, a, Sorry. yes, uh, Cécile, just uh, to remind, it's, uh, it's really great to have you here. You're the president of La Fabrique de la Cité. Just a reminder, it's a think tank for urban innovations. Uh, a pleasure to have you. You have the floor for the next eight minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, happy to be uh, with you this afternoon from Paris. Um, I think that this topic is quite interesting and, and uh, I would start by, by challenging the, the very idea of cities' digital sovereignty. Um, why? Because I think that we agree that there is a, a preeminence of cities when it comes to the final vision to uh, on how the smart the digital can help fulfilling this vision. But I think that there is no such thing as a city's digital sovereignty yet. And uh, truly, I think it's something cities need to be aware of. And I, I trust this is also uh, one of the, the topics of this conference. Um, so where do we find digital sovereignty in, in this landscape of academics, of business, uh, cities and people? Well, I think that uh, when, we, when we look carefully at it, I think at the end of the day, it's in the hands of those who produce and decide to share or not the data they produce. And in most cases, it points to citizens. And I would like to, to um, underline this paradox because we uh, so in this, the session, but also in the uh, in Beth Novak uh, intervention previously, that it's very difficult to involve citizens, but they are in this field to the sovereign. So th this paradox we have to solve, and um, and the point is that those citizens having those data, uh, when they put the hat of consumer, they have absolutely no problem sharing or giving their sovereignty to others. And uh, just think about it, we all, most of them, most of us, we are locked in in our apartment and science got their uh, company called Amazon and we have no problem sharing a lot of data with Amazon. They know everything we eat, everything, every movie we watch currently. And this is not a problem why for us to share this sovereignty because we trust that in return, we will, we will get uh, a service with good quality. So I think you pointed out, uh, Gerhard, in your introduction, this question of trust. And the question we have to solve, I think, today, uh, nowadays, it's this question of trust. It's at the heart of um, the uh, public, private, people collaboration. We need to push for digital innovation to serve cities' vision and projects. And I think this is partly true in um, a field which has to do with city's future, with the future attractiveness, with the future, I would say, liability. It's when it comes to cities planning for decarbonation and for fighting or managing um, climate change. And uh, what we see now is that cities, private companies, academics and people are not aligned. And I think what you mentioned, uh, Marin uh, Janssen, uh, Professor Janssen, in your, um, in your introduction is this problem of alignment, alignment of time frame, alignment of vision, alignment of means. And clearly in this topic, which is not a, a secondary one, we have this big problem of alignment. And um, 
let me take an example. It's something we worked um, uh, with the French energy market regulator, Commission de Régulation d'Energie, which created three years ago uh, a comedy of perspective. And one of the uh, working group um, I I'm chairing is about how you work on um, the end consumers, the individual consumer, energy consumer, I mean, and how you create trust. And this is a very important question. Um, just let me take an example. We all have in our countries a huge, huge problem when it comes to energy retrofitting of buildings. We spend billions of euros or other currencies and for very, very poor results. But the problem is that we all know that in order to decarbonize our economies, we need to be successful in that. So up to now, we have used very traditional methods, uh, I would say very mechanical ones, and they, they, they are not up to the challenge. They are not uh, at the right scale. They don't put us on the right tempo as well in order to decarbonize our economies. And I think in these topics, and this is something we worked uh, with this uh, working group of the uh, French Energy Regulators Perspective Committee, it's because one of the key problems is that data are there, but they are not shared. And why? Because people don't trust each other to be, um, well, to be, uh, to make the, their part of the deal, of the contract. So we don't go anywhere. And the lack of trust um, opened out on quality of problem of quality of service, quality of, uh, of works, uh, privacy, um, privacy issues. And this is, I think, in this field, uh, the only key is with data. The only key is with digital technologies because we need, we have some, uh, for example, of uh, problems integrating behavioral dimension in this. And for the moment, we are nowhere on this. So in this field, I think, how can we work? There, um, to come back on this question of trust, I think cities, they, I'm not sure they have to be a sovereign when it comes to, um, to digital, but they have to be trust enabler. And for the moment, um, um, I'm not sure they have been able to build this trust. And uh, what we, one suggestion I would like to put in the debate um, is this, um, this tool very much used by uh, energy or also financial regulators in, in the UK, which are the sandboxes. When you have such a distrust in the precise field between different um, players who don't share the same agenda, who don't have the same time frame in their mind, I think the sandbox is the possibility to innovate under the supervision of regulators. It can be the energy regulator plus the data regulator can be a way to overcome this obstacle and to test this innovation we need because in this field and i would like to come to this point we, we know we don't need only incremental in the innovation we need rupture um, innovation and this way of uh, testing the limit of the i would say of the regulation when it comes to privacy when it comes to um to uh, other fields um the, the sandboxes can be a right tool so it's also a way for people to speak um, people who know each other, but we, 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 we are used to speak together, but uh, for the very short term, to come back to what Marin Janssen said. For example, an energy company later will speak about the next uh, regulation, not about what will happen in 10 years. So in this kind of tool, you can create different kind of relationship, relationship between the players and make them, I would say, get out, get out of their usual zone of comfort and try really and innovate. So um, this is this is um, something I would like to throw into the debate. Uh, this um, license to innovate and license uh, at the end of the day to create trust between players. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Cecil. Uh, Cecile, uh, Cecil, for raising so many interesting points. I mean, we start the sovereignty. That, that's a big issue here in Germany. This question: how to enable trust. I think these are really important. Points you've raised, the sandbox approaches. I mean, do you have one example of a city who is experimenting with that? So I know it more from central government level, but who is there? Is, is there is already used by cities? And what one or two examples could you give us where to look at for that? Uh, well, to to in the French context, um, um, on in this field, uh, we have seen uh, quite interesting things. Uh, for example, in Rennes, 
or in Lyon. Um, but the, the, the question is that um, if there is innovation at the level of the city, it doesn't reach for the moment the innovation at the, at the level of regulators and companies um, working together. So this is, uh, I think this is only beginning. This is, uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, ongoing process, but uh, there are some uh, interesting um, attempts to do that. Thank you. And now we are glad to have Margarita back with us. Hopefully now the camera, uh, the, the, the microphone also works. It looked quite well. Okay, Can you wonderful. hear me? Yeah. Oh, uh, and you have <laughs> great to have you back. <laughs> um, you have a presentation. Do you want to control that or should I do that? Um, it will be a long shot if I try to do it, but let's try. Let's try. <laughs> That I should try it or you do it? I have already uh, started screen sharing. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah, it's coming. Wonderful. Good. The door is yours. Great. Fantastic. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me here. It's an honor. Uh, I am Marguerite Angelidou. I am a smart city expert. And I have been working on the topic of uh, smart cities ever since the first appearance of the term, like almost 20 years ago. And uh, I am lucky enough to have worked on the topic from different um, roles, including business, researching, teaching, working with, with the civil society and so on. So today I am going to talk, uh, talk to you about emerging trends on smart, smart cities in Europe and specifically those trends that are related to intersectoral collaboration. So now starting out with what we already know from previous work that has been done, in a recent study of the European Commission, it was found that 40% of Europe's smart city projects are impl being implemented through a mix of public and private funds. And another 10% of the projects are implemented exclusively through private capital. And yet, uh, Europe's policymakers are struggling with promoting efficient stakeholder collaboration, securing the financial resources that are needed uh, in order to design and deploy smart city services and tools. And even more so, they struggle with making projects sustainable beyond the funding period. That said, uh, I chose to give you some very fresh insights from um, uh, smart, city, smart city experts in this regard. This, uh, these insights come from a foresight exercise about emerging trends on smart cities in Europe that we ran at the company that I now work for, that is QPlan International, within the EU Horizon 2020 project RRI to scale. So we had over 120 smart city experts participate in the survey. So I'm, I'm confident that the results uh, will be useful for our workshop today. So I will jump right to the findings. The first finding is that over the forthcoming 10 years, the experts believe that policymakers will continue to seek investment from the private sector in order to develop sustainable business models for their smart city projects. And uh, the experts believe that uh, mo most public authorities will likely not be able to afford a loan such massive investments. And besides, they claim that um, the private and civic sector can offer valuable dynamism for creating economic and societal impact. In any case, they said that inter, uh, intersectoral collaborations uh, should be governed by commonly agreed objectives and values. And finally, they noted that there is a lack of successful examples of how this can be done in practice. The second finding is that there was no consensus among the experts about whether policymakers will adopt an, an entrepreneurial mindset when it comes to the development of smart city services. So on one hand, a large portion of the experts believe that policymakers will adopt a business model logic 
towards smart city services because by doing so they will be able to document how they create and deliver public value and uh, they will also be able to quantify and put forward the, the societal, environmental and economic impact of the smart city initiatives. And also they will be able uh, by these means to ensure that uh, smart city services will have a meaningful value proposition for the end users. On the other hand, however, uh, a large par part of uh, the experts that we surveyed uh, believe that a transformation uh, towards entrepreneurial mindsets in public institutions will, will happen very slowly and painfully, or even not happen at all. And uh, in any case, it will be unequally distributed across EU countries and cities. And that is fairly logical, uh, considering that being entrepreneurial is more often not embedded in the culture of local government. The third find, finding is that there was no consensus about whether the outsourcing of smart city services will downplay the importance of societal and environmental benefits. So again, on one hand, experts uh, adopted an optimistic viewpoint and argued that societal and environmental benefits will increasingly become more important than economic benefits. But on the other hand, there is a whole a big pessimistic guard of experts who are concerned that smart city policies will rather get stuck in efficiency improvements and market-driven innovation trajectories in which societal benefits will be secondary. And our last interesting finding uh, with, uh, con with concern to our workshop of today is that technology lock-in is not going to be much of an issue anymore during the forthcoming years in Europe. And that said, until recent years, we knew that uh, European cities face a real technology lock-in danger when working with private vendors and that the highly concentrated smart city market reduces their bargaining power, but it seems that this uh, situation is changing. And uh, more particularly, the technology lock-in danger is already being identified, anticipated and dealt with at EU level. So this gives re reason to believe that this undesirable future will not eventually arise. Secondly, vendors themselves are not playing the lock-in game anymore because public institutions demand interoperability. And last but not least, we had a very nice comment from one of the experts uh, who noted that maybe uh, a risk of political lock-in is uh, greater and that would be that decision makers will turn to trusted suppliers for the acquisition of smart city products. And uh, with this closing slide, I would like to highlight the complex puzzle of bits and pieces, tensions and relationships, economic and societal goals that characterize intersectoral collaboration in the smart city of 2030. And once again, I would like to, to thank you for having me here. Thanks a lot, um, Margrethe. This is really a lot of interesting insights. I mean, for me, this, this that lockdown is not an issue, is a little bit surprising. This is definitely something we can discuss. Yes. The previous session, we had a lot of um, quite skeptical comments on cooperating with the big techs that you are, you, that you are locked down, that these platforms are over dominating. So that's something what you definitely can discuss. Now we'd like to move forward to our next um, um, in panelist, um, giving a short introductory statement, Francesc Paolo Bosch. Very warm welcome. What is your experience? What are your insights um, you can share with us on this topic of intersector collaboration? Because you have also done a lot of research on this business model idea um, of, of smart cities. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to, to be here today. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure uh, to be in such uh, an interesting panel in, in such an interesting uh, symposium. Um, after this intervention, it's not easy to, to get the micro, but uh, let me try to, to provide you 
another point of view about how I think we can make uh, viable the transition from a traditional city to a smart um, one. And I will try to do it uh, very, very briefly. Uh, each uh, municipality, each uh, local government uh, needs to, to articulate a logic of how it uh, creates uh, value in a long term and in a sustainable way uh, for uh, and uh, with its citizens. But, uh, but it's also important uh, to do that for and uh, with its uh, companies. And I want to highlight uh, the word companies and I would like to reinforce the idea of uh, local uh, companies. If we uh, analyze uh, from a holistic point of uh, view the, the war uh, where we are living, and I am quite sure that uh, all of us will be agree, we can say that um, uh, our world has developed a society that uh, has unlimited uh, needs, but um, we have a scarce uh, resources. And uh, when I am saying resources, I am talking about uh, natural resources, but I am also talking about uh, money, which is the key of, of, uh, of uh, business models, um, because it's the key for, for financing this kind of, of public uh, services. Uh, so uh, we need to be efficient and effective, um, offering, uh, creating new, new services, new products for our citizens. And we need uh, to do that balancing uh, the three main axes of uh, sustainable uh, development, uh, social needs, environmental protection, and of course, economic um, viability. Uh, and just doing it, uh, municipalities will be capable of creating smart cities that will be habitable, equitable, and, uh, and viable. Uh, uh, the, effect the effectiveness and efficiency uh, many times, maybe too many times do not come uh, from public sector, uh, do not come with uh, public sector. Uh, uh, but uh, there is uh, another important thing uh, in that sense. Uh, and nowadays, even uh, for effective and efficient cities, it is quite uh, complicated to create entirely by, by, them, the, by themselves uh, the smart city uh, services needed um, for their citizens. Uh, so uh, from my point of view, uh, nowadays, uh, city governments um, um, would increasingly uh, be the ones of guiding, uh, dynamizing, in short, they uh, would increasingly be just uh, the guarantors of public service rather than ones of creating, uh, delivering and, and capturing uh, the value. When public uh, sector collaborates with private companies, NGOs, or any other uh, non-public uh, organization, um, cities get, uh, get uh, many, many benefits uh, because private sector in addition to the, the efficiency and the flexibility, uh, or the, or uh, in addition to the, um, the effectiveness, um, uh, it usually offers um, other other kind of, of advantages like the financing, uh, innovation, or uh, a specific uh, know-how that cities uh, uh, do not have. And uh, this is the reason why I think that cities need to establish alliances, uh, partnership. With other actors coming from from private sector in order to produce these smart uh, services uh, and the result of this approach uh, should be a network of organizations uh, linked upstream and downstream of a value chain that generates a value creation ecosystem and, and i think that this is one of the key um, words or one of the key concepts that i want to introduce uh, uh, the value creation uh, ecosystem always each actor in this ecosystem uh, increase um, the value of um, the product or the service that, um, that, they, that they receive. And theoretically, they should be um, able to capture a piece of this value created. However, uh, however it, uh, it is important uh, to bear in mind that, uh, that the, relationship, the relationship established among the actors is based, is based on, on, a, on a combination of, of, of things. Uh, from one hand, they are, uh, co they are establishing a, a cooperation for producing uh, and delivering the value into the hands of the last consumer, but it is also true that these private uh, actors uh, are often uh, competing for capturing a bigger piece of the value created. Um, and sometimes it is uh, not easy for, for some of the actors, especially 
the local companies, the small companies, to ensure its sustainability with the piece of the of the value that they are uh, capturing. And in that sense, I would recommend, uh, and I and with it I, I will finish my my intervention. I would recommend cities uh, to promote the construction of these ecosystems for doing. Uh, 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 and, and, and for doing it, uh, they should consider at least the following uh, key questions. So, uh, what activities are needed to create uh, the new value for citizens? Um, the second one uh, would be what actors are necessary uh, to develop these activities? Um, another important question, the third one, should be uh, what is considered value for all of the stakeholders involved? in these activities and uh, how much value and this is also important how much value do they need to be uh, sustainable because then municipalities will be able to develop strategies and many times uh, cities uh, do not have a clear strategy that will uh, pay attention beyond the local firms um, and usually uh, the local firms of these value creation ecosystems are the bigger ones so if cities create a strategy, they, they will be capable of creating a strategies, uh, paying attention again uh, beyond these focal films. And they uh, and then uh, they will contribute to consolidate the business models of all the stakeholders performing activities for delivering uh, public value. Uh, because we must remember uh, that uh, that nowadays um, public administration are still crucial uh, player, at least uh, to set up the conditions for, for engaging uh, the private sector. In, in the different projects where, where we have uh, been, uh, been working, uh, however, we have seen um, in Europe that, uh, the, that the smart cities industry are, uh, is attractive to engage uh, the private companies for developing uh, business around them. Uh, they are you are, are uh, developing value propositions um, that show uh, a, a real desire of creating a positive impact either on climate change mitigation and uh, or, and social welfare but uh, the eu the national authorities and also the municipal governments have in my opinion the responsibility to set up the, the conditions to to help industrial stakeholders to overcome the um, the barriers, the important barriers that they are facing nowadays to implement and to scale up the, the smart solutions that they are uh, developing. And that's all from, from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francesc. I think this is really promising for our discussion that we're going to have uh, later to see how many different angles exist from, on this specific topic. Uh, I think this is a great segue to our last presentation we have. Uh, Ralf Martin Soa, uh, who is joining us today. So we have, uh, so he is the founding director of the Smart City Center of Excellent Finest Twins, and so uh, senior research fellow at the Ragnar Nurkse Department. I'm sorry for my pronunciation. Uh, today he brings us very exciting insights from Estonia. We're looking forward to it. So uh, Ralf Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and uh, and uh, well, welcome also from my side. From and I think um, my position is a bit different because I have been initiating uh, jointly with different partners uh, with Smart City Centre of Excellence uh, uh, already by default as intersectoral, meaning that, uh, that uh, either it is like experiment that, uh, that we will succeed and then very show that, uh, that companies, uh, universities, uh, cities can effectively work together or it's like, uh, like lessons to be learned. But this has been a framework uh, for me since uh, 2013 when I entered the field of uh, smart city. So definitely later when uh, Margarita uh, that, uh, mentioned uh, before as well. Um, and uh, and uh, and I, I like uh, what Evelyn mentioned that uh, that this is the finest uh, or finest uh, um, twins uh, center, meaning that uh, that. Uh, that we also have another dimension that we were initiated by a cluster of uh, technology companies uh, actually from both sides uh, in Estonia and Finland and then we teamed up with, uh, with uh, two tech 
tech, tech, two tech universities and then later also involved uh, ministry and, uh, and, and city from both sides. So as a, as a like, uh, center, we have been initiated by Aalto University from uh, Finnish side, uh, Tallinn Uni University of Technology from Estonia side, and then also uh, an innovation company owned by the city of Helsinki, Forum Virum Helsinki, and then uh, uh, two, two ministries from Estonian government side. So this is the setup uh, we are already now. And, uh, and why I'm mentioning uh, Finnish twins, not finest twins, is that our uh, Finnish friends uh, uh, every time get very ex excited uh, when we mention that this is the finest twins project, because this means that there's a country called Finland uh, because we refer to Finland and Estonia. And, uh, and uh, what it also is, is important uh, to mention from the beginning on, as Marijn uh, was mentioning as well, that, uh, that we really want to put a lot of focus on this uh, uh, PPPP, so, uh, so public-private people partnership uh, initiatives, meaning that, uh, that, uh, that the most challenging part is involving the people, and, uh, and this has been uh, the, something we have learned as well, that, uh, that, uh, that even if a core setup and even if we very effectively work with cities, uh, companies uh, and, uh, and researchers, and uh, somehow we can leverage it, uh, then this fourth dimension is, is the biggest challenge, uh, and, and here all kinds of models uh, are very much uh, welcomed. Uh, and from Estonia side, uh, uh, also like following uh, this, uh, this trust uh, challenge uh, or trust uh, component introduced by Cecile in the beginning, but, uh, but uh, I think uh, the positive side uh, from uh, like a government perspective is that there is like some level of trust uh, between local governments and central governments in, in terms of private data exchange in Estonia. And some we will call this like as a digital island that, uh, that, uh, that most of uh, local government services uh, works online. Uh, there was only one exemption that, uh, that you couldn't get married and divorced online. Everything else is online uh, from a local government perspective. And now they are really recently what like uh, two weeks ago started digitalizing the marriage and, uh, and divorce as well. So that means that, uh, that this COVID uh, time really like uh, is not affecting that much from uh, like a local government perspective. But our huge challenge is that, uh, that Estonia is not a small country, it's a micro country. So it's like one million people. And we have effectively developed a micro or, or like a digital island uh, that, uh, that services are not that interoperable uh, cross borderly and, uh, and and that means also like from uh, from a perspective of uh, of Tallinn for example that a lot of commuting actually goes towards uh, city of Helsinki which is like uh, like economically very stronger and uh, and uh, and really like is like the closest attraction point for everybody in in, in Tallinn and uh, and that means that uh, that the digital services do not follow the people uh, and, 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 and a lot of people that have two, somehow two identities in two different cities, we need to have uh, two different ways of uh, consuming the service as well, like starting even from parking or, or transportation and so on. So even like most, most basic services are, are not that, uh, that interoperable. And that really means that, uh, that a big issue uh, we are seeing and that combines both uh, uh, interest of companies and cities as well is uh, as well, but uh, but uh, one smart city plus another smart city does not equal a smart region. Uh, very often, it, it's not the case uh, because there, it's it's so standardized the process that every city is, is using its own keyboard uh, as a standard, and uh, and then one is using QWERTY that everybody is 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 known here, but uh, another is using another keyboard, and, and now you need some kind of layers to have to put those together and, and that's that's a big challenge and how we are dealing with that as a center and as a, as a initiated by European Commission and the Estonian government with a quite substantial grant of uh, 32 million euros as a seed funding um, we have decided to invest half of the grant uh, into actual uh, PPPP pilots so I have to stop at the right P every time I'm, I'm, I'm saying it but, uh, but this is like something that, uh, that really did uh, and, and nobody forced us, nobody said that, uh, that uh, you should do those pilots, but this is something that we really thought that uh, could be like our contribution, but, uh, but how to take research outside. And, uh, and we have designed those pilots in a way that, uh, that so we are investing 15 million euros over the 
next uh, seven years into into uh, smart city pilots ourselves. And the core principle there is that, uh, that, uh, that uh, in a first step, we ask uh, cities uh, to agree on the challenges what they have in the, in the future. So, and for that, uh, we involved uh, 35 local governments from Estonia this summer, and through interviews, workshops, uh, uh, service, we came to the agreement that, uh, that which ones are the top 10, uh, like the biggest challenges what Estonian local governments are facing. And, uh, and uh, that was very, very well perceived and feedback by the cities as well. And secondly, we did uh, open up this competition for research-based ideas to everybody. And that was our approach to involve citizens as well. Everybody came and some idea how to make it better, could participate. And so we received 71 ideas. And now we are starting with, uh, or started already with four large-scale pilots. Each pilot involves at least two cities, also financially, so we're uh, paying some costs of implementation of cities. Uh, each uh, pilot uh, is uh, led by researchers, both very often from either from Taltec or Aalto University side. And then importantly, each pilot has some kind of market uh, approach as well, that we collaborate, uh, we seek companies to go invest or when we are looking for spin-off companies to be made. And so this is the approach uh, we are experimenting here with, and I thank you very much for your audience and, and for your interest in this. Uh, uh, and uh, like very importantly as well, that, uh, that those uh, pilots range from the fields of energy, mobility, built environment, uh, governance and data. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I can later put the link as well, where you can have one newspaper uh, or one, one news piece on, on covering uh, those pilots as well, just to get some intuition. And, and we are also repeating this, so we're now looking for the investment into a governance based uh, governance field pilots uh, starting from 2020. So thank you from my side, uh, and I'm very looking forward to, for the discussion. Thank Thanks you a lot. so much. Yes, thank you so much, Martin. Um, so great again to see the diversity that we have here on this panel uh, regarding academic background or business uh, background or civil society. Really, really, yeah. Again, sounds great for the moderated discussion. Before we move on to this, we have a uh, tool that up with the great panelists that we have with us here today. Uh, if uh, you want to already, people who are watching um, this panel, if you want to already start asking questions, intervening in the chat, yeah. you're more than welcome to do so. We're going to move on again to the moderated discussion in a few, but then I'm going to let Gerhard uh, lead the, the toilet up for now. Yep. We have now four more um, um, panelists here with us. We would like to ask you very shortly, um, we have now received many inputs, insights from our speakers. Um, where do you agree? What are the kind of points you, you see similar? But also, are we missing certain points um, just to um, continue with a more broader discussion and enlarging the, 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 the insights, the points you have raised? And we have two colleagues more from the Berlin um, um, we call it now a um, value creation ecosystem, and we have two experts more from the international arena. Let's start with the international experts. Kuhn, you're doing a lot of research on innovation and collaboration, intersectoral collaboration. Yeah, well, um, uh, thanks for having me here. I'm, I'm very glad that I could be part of this. Um, so we have done recent research on, on intersectoral innovation partnerships in, uh, in e-health. It's not exactly smart cities, but the interesting thing is that e-health projects have been around for longer and there are, pro there are quite some successful cases and they range from very small apps to, to big share uh, data sharing platforms. So they are often very complex and they also have a very complex setup because you have uh, this mix of public and private actors. Um, and from that, so, so we did interviews in five countries with 19 cases, uh, 140 people, public-private, and, and a few elements come out which have been stressed also here. Um, and I would like to build up on that. For example, this, this element of trust building, um, which has been raised by Cecile and by others, yeah. uh, is, is crucial. And they're basically, um, it's crucial because what happens in these partnerships is basically yeah, and the process of collaborative innovation, as Jacob Perf calls it. And what you actually need are four processes. And if you don't have sufficient trust, this process 
just break down. You need synergy between different resources. Huh? You need to learn from each other individually, but also as, an, as a partnership, you need to learn. You need to build consensus around emerging ideas because often there are more ideas than, than, than should be uh, uh, should necessary and you need to build commitment for the implementation and the implementation could be by some or by all or some will use the issues and in order to build that trust what we found there, there are more results in our reports but i would like to raise uh, four elements which i haven't heard that much so far yeah. First of all, the way you built the governance of this innovation partnership is not to be underestimated and it should be contingent upon the composition of the uh, partnership, of the size and of its goal. Um, and you can read more in the report, but what we actually found is that the most innovative partnerships differ in terms of their governance related to the size, their, their objective, and so on. So, for, so often, if you have a small network, which is heavily dominated by public actors, it's best to have a lead actor governance, so, so one lead actor. But if you have a societal partnership with a lot of uh, actors around, and with government only be a small part, you need some kind of shared governance structure. So that's the first element. The second element is this um, interaction or, or this kind of management strategies you use to manage the collaboration. You, there are two main approaches. There's the network management component, so, which is more focusing on interactions and relations. So that's basically about connecting people, connecting organizations, connecting resources. It's about explorative strategies to create new ideas and creativity. It's about arranging so, so who should be involved in which discussion and who should not and some process rules about decision making um, but if you only do that then you probably often end up in networks which are basically like talking shops they don't come to actual conclusions so you also need to manage agreements at a certain point certainly with complex elements you might have id generation which is a bit loosely structured but once you come to implementation, of course, you need good agreements. And this, uh, this alternation between network management and contract management to assign risk, uh, um, uh, to, to, to uh, have common goals and implementation strategies is very important. And it also differs on the emphasis of the project. Some projects are more like long-term long ID building that's mainly network management, a bit of contract management. The other ones are very factual. They are very concrete. They need to build like a, an application or something. And there you need a strong emphasis on contract management uh, surrounded with network management. Um, a third condition, but I won't go too, too deep into it. Uh, so so Marijn told about the, the motivations to join from these different actors. But you also need certain capacities with the individuals. These individuals need to be, yeah, to say it simple, to be have some kind of trusting attitude, but also to be trustworthy. And they need to be, yeah, they need to have connective capacities, learning capacities, and so on. Um, and then the other condition was about user involvement, but I've uh, noticed that the previous session was about citizen centricity so i won't go too much into that but it's basically involving citizens uh, aligns the viewpoints of the public and the private partners around a common uh, uh, picture and then the last element is basically the interaction between the use of ict uh, to foster collaboration and innovation in the partnership and how it relates to trust so what we found is the use of ICT, for example, for communication and interaction between partners in COVID times. We're also sitting here online meeting uh, to set up testing environments and to uh, create knowledge and to share data. It's, it's very, uh, it's a very strong advantage, but you can only rely on it if there is already some kind of ex-ante trust building among partners, which basically uh, yeah, certainly in COVID times, it means you cannot do everything digitally. Basically, you need to start physically 
and then you can develop digital tools to uh, create your network and to build up a dynamic. Um, yeah, there are more elements in our work, but I was just wanted to share this point because I thought they might uh, add some yeah. elements that are interesting. Thank you, Kuhn, for these many interesting insights again, how to make these collaborations work. Um, we need to look a little bit more on the time um, timing. I um, would like to ask now the other three um, 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 commenters for, for their input. Eyal, you're from Israel. I mean, we, we have seen in the chat a little bit about the entrepreneurial state. And I mean, Israel is definitely something with a very vibrant kind of um, startup community, um, 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 very much, very much features of this ecosystem, um, um, innovative ecosystem. Can you share a little bit your insights from um, Israel on that topic? Yes. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for having me here in this uh, very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I learned a lot from, from the other speakers. Um, Israel is, is a very uh, uh, special case for me, uh, not always in, in the positive uh, sense, because um, the, the startup uh, uh, ecosystem is really huge uh, in terms of the small country. Um, but the problem is that uh, um, the citizens in Israel are not always enjoy the advancement of the technological ecosystem, which is a little bit a kind of paradox. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of startups, I, I live in Tel Aviv, almost every street, there are few uh, startups in, in, in buildings. They, of course, influence the entire economy and the entire local economy of Tel Aviv. But uh, uh, many citizens in Israel are not enjoying these technologies. These technologies go very fast for, for uh, customers abroad. So um, this brings me, and I, I think uh, the, the, the technology, technology issue was mentioned here in a few uh, uh, talks. Um, the technology, focusing on technology will bring us only evolutionary or incremental advancement. This is a, a kind of paradox because technologies, companies, they are focusing mostly in their past. Most of companies, you know, the, the, there is the, the startup uh, uh, companies are very small portion of the industry. Most companies, they're focusing in the past. They developed something and now they're trying to exploit it. And they are doing a lot in order to exploit. The company developed uh, uh, LED lighting, which is really something from the past. And they are trying to sell it again and again and again to all municipalities. But this is definitely not radical innovation. And uh, um, so when, when the, the technology companies lead the, the, the um, um, the trends and, and lead the, the industry, they are interested in incremental innovation. Also, when municipalities taking their part and, and trying to, to advance uh, and, and, and create projects of smart cities, they are also, this is only incremental innovation. The only way to make a radical innovation is the collaboration of all shareholders, and especially the citizens, because citizens and academy are looking in the future. They're interested in the future. Municipalities are interested in the present. Technology, most of the industry is interested in the past and how to exploit what they did already. Citizens and, and the academy are interested in the future. And only collaboration of all these parties will bring us to a real uh, radical innovation. Thanks a lot for this really interesting insight. I mean, we are going back to the PPP, the, the four P's, and not just the public and um, private collaboration, really, in order to really make the, this, this value creation, the, the, the radical transformation. Thanks a lot. Um, now we have two um, um, panelists um, from Berlin. Would be interested to hear a little bit more their local perspective from Berlin. Sven, you're even member of the Berlin Smart City Board. Very much welcome. Floor is yours now. The stage is yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Gerhard. Uh, that was really a, a lot of input. And uh, I want to go back to Margarita's input and to what Eyal said, because I think here we have something very important. Um, uh, as a member of the uh, Smart City Strategy Board here in Berlin, I do miss what Margarita found in her second finding that there is a missing entrepreneurial um, mindset in a lot of the uh, administration. And the startups and the people, as Eyal has uh, just uh, pointed out, are looking into the future and they want to solve problems. They want to use technology to improve the life in the cities. But it's not in the um, interest of the bigger companies or of the administration. They have no real, no real incentives to be fast and disruptive. So um, I am uh, involved in a lot of management training for big uh, companies here in Germany. And it's so interesting to see that the startup mindset is really something that is difficult to understand for managers in the corporate world. Um, it's the theory is clear to them, but how to realize an agile and fast moving organization is um, an unknown uh, uh, process. And I guess the same is true for the administration. So bringing this cooperation, um, this, this is a panel for intersectoral collaboration. And I really want to support what Margarita found and what Eyal said. And I think I heard it in some of the others' presentations as well. Let's openly find a way to increase the entrepreneurial mindset, a problem solving mindset, because the people don't want to have hour long discussions waiting for years. The startups don't have the time for lengthy bureaucracy. They want to test their ideas. And uh, I'm pretty sure that if we could look deeper in the smart city center at Eyal's uh, university, this living lab atmosphere that they uh, offer the startups, we can also learn a lot uh, from, from his university. So I want to point out that we have to get going. Uh, we heard a lot of initiatives uh, but I think we have to to come up with struct with processes with with structures that realize what we have discussed not only here in this panel but the whole day. Maybe that's it. Thanks a lot, Sven. And I, I think you're clearly already referring to the workshop for tomorrow, which is about. <laughs> administrative capacity, also how to make governments more agile, how to make them more open towards this entrepreneurial mind. That's definitely what we somehow want to cover tomorrow in the last workshop in at, at four o'clock again. And now we finally want to welcome Ferdinand Schuster from the Berlin located um, Institute for the, for the Sector. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to this um, distinguished um, around here um, and thank you for the great presentations uh, by the way um, i have to mention that i'm not only uh, representing the public governance institute here with this part of the business sector of course but uh, the berlin merchants association uh, as well where i'm chairing the the smart city um, council um, so, uh, I, I, the, the longer um, I deal with uh, smart city concepts and the longer I follow the discussion on smart cities, um, the more I have serious doubts whether there is a master plan at all. I, I think um, we are talking too much about how a smart city should look like. Um, I think um, we should perhaps um, think more about what a smart city should deliver, actually, and less how it is going to look like. Um, I think that um, in the whole process of um, moving towards whatever a smart city might be, uh, maybe is um, government capability is, is absolute key, um, because government has the role of oversight of 
setting standards of um, enter into long-term contracts because we all know and we all agreed on the um, way of having a partnership uh, in order to achieve a smart city again whatever this may be in the in the end so someone has to do the contract work and uh, to maintain contracts to do and, and to to ensure that this is done on a level playing field of, on equal footing between business the civil society uh, ngos uh, and and government or the administration and um, the public administration but what a government role should not be in my view is to prescribe technologies or um, specific solutions uh, but um, to ensure that there is an open an openness for new solutions and perhaps new technologies as well and um, i believe that um, we I have doubts, uh, to, to put it that way, I have doubts whether um, we should look for radical innovation. Disruption is a buzzword today, but I believe that imitation is innovation as well. And to look around to other cities, other solutions, other sectors of, of society and, and simply imitate what is already happening there, what is already established there, it could perhaps be a safer road towards a smart city than to look for the big thing, the big new thing that is not existing and is perhaps a total failure. Uh, I, I want to recall what Marijn Janssen has said, that collaboration often fails. And that is my, my, opinion, my opinion too. And I want to voice some doubt whether the concept of digital sovereignty is worth uh, to embark on. Um, I think, um, at least from a Central European perspective, we have lost the race already. Um, the big platforms are either American or Asian, but certainly not European. And I don't know whether there is any serious um, reason to throw billions and billions of euros on establishing a European solution, or whether simply get a solution that's already on the market and concentrate on data sovereignty and proper contracts with those uh, platforms um, i look at the, at the, the in the past uh, we had several examples in the defense industry uh, for instance where we tried to develop european solutions they all turned to be very very expensive they came up when their technology was long outdated uh, and the product was on the market already for rather cheap money and therefore, I don't think whether uh, it's a good solution to do this in terms of digitization. Um, so openness, I think, is uh, the key word. Maintain openness for new uh, solutions. And that would be my opening statement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ferdinand. I think you are doing a great job at uh, sparking some discussion for uh, our next section, which is the moderated discussion. So here we're really happy to hear insights of, uh, from everyone, including people uh, who are viewing the panel right now. You are very much welcome to use the chat. We'll uh, make sure to take a look. Uh, attention that personally I found really interesting uh, hearing you all talk was there this idea that we see on the one side uh, city, uh, the city being this trust enabling force, which is there to safeguard the fundamental rights of the citizens, whom we are dependent on uh, to see it not, not even on an ethics uh, point of view, but simply on a really strategic point of view. And on the other side, this push that many speakers have talked about towards a partnership with the private sectors who certainly have their own strengths and have been highlighted, but also their own incentives. So I think there's a reconciliation that is sometimes difficult to make here. Uh, just a thought like this, uh, you're free to intervene uh, on any comments that have been made by the speakers or the panelists. Well, I'm simply going to open the floor and we have until uh, roughly 5.40, 5.35, then I'm going to ask you all to say a few words about what you see for the future of, um, of partnerships uh, in 20 years. What do you, would you expect? But before then, uh, simply make sure to participate as much as you want.
Well, um, okay. if there's no one, maybe I can uh, simply make an echo with something that has been said in the chat discussion uh, already yeah. quite a while ago uh, about, uh, this was from Oliver Rack, which has mentioned that, and I think this echoes your presentation, Cecile, uh, which is about the fact that the German government uh, hasn't made many efforts to build trust for, for citizens. And I, um, I think this raises also an important point about what is possible to be done even at the city level, which is personally a question I had listening to you. So how much of this is actually the responsibility of cities and how much of this is actually the responsibility of the national government? Yeah, yeah I, I, I feel this, um, this remark in the chat and um, I, I don't know, I don't know if uh, the person who made this remark was French or not. Uh, I, I couldn't be able to, 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 to speak about German cities, but an interesting uh, point when it comes to trust, uh, you may have seen some uh, recent international uh, surveys about the level of trust in different countries. I refer to a work which has been done in the uh, Institut d'études politiques Sciences Po in Paris by Yann Algon, the School of Public Affairs. And uh, he, was, he has been studying the level of trust in the OECD's countries. And uh, France with the US is the country where the level of trust in institutions between people in science is the lowest. And uh, there is one exception in this landscape, which is a well-known one, but which is uh, still holding in this landscape is the, the, the person, the institution French people trust the most is their mayor. It's not the government, it's not the expert, it's not the uh, other kind of people, it's their mayor. So I think we have a kind of uh, trust tank, at least in France, but I think it's, it's true in other uh, countries, which is for the moment unexploited because in our system of a much too much centralized system where uh, you have uh, big initiatives taken by the government which is not based on the problem solving mindset and i come to your uh, point then i think you're totally right we have come to a point where uh, our cities do have problems to to solve and this is why i, I was mentioning in my um, in my introductory statement, this question of uh, energy retrofitting, but we can speak about congestion, we, we can speak about air quality. We have actual problem to solve. And in the mindset of citizen, it's very concrete. So if you want to embed citizen to, 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 to make them a part of the, of the, of the smart city thing, we have to address very, very concrete topics. And I, I, I fear that we're still in what Ferdinand described, kind of description of a, a, a utopian smart city, which is of no interest for, for, for most of the people. And I would like to, to come as well to, to what um, Eyal Yaniv said. I, I found it very interesting what you said about uh, at the end of the day, with companies are focused on the past, um, cities are focusing and struggling with the present and the only people who are looking forward, looking beyond are uh, citizens and academics. And this is so true and I think to me, and sorry to be a bit philosophical after having said that we have to be very concrete, is a very difference between innovation and progress. Uh, I know this is very debated, but people, um, they want to see some progress in their daily life in their cities and um, th th they, they want to have a vision and when it comes I, I come back to the question of the vision be because paradoxically the more efficient the more problem solving uh, the city will be if they have a vision uh, about what they want to be and for the moment I'm not sure that uh, cities have worked enough on this question of vision. Sure. May I maybe raise a question? I mean, also a little bit looking at the comment by Joanna, but also um, what Francesc said before. I mean, we have to clearly think, I mean, which actors we want to involve in the creation of this kind of innovation ecosystem. What I currently see is a strong focus, nearly exclusive focus on these startups. 
And I mean, but we have to be clear that private, that's not only the startups, that's the big techs, that's um, small and medium sized enterprises, where especially in Germany, we are really good at, we have a lot, lot of local government, local government companies here in Germany, which also have an innovation potential. So, I mean, which kind of, which is this P, this private, is it? The local government is it more the the, the gov techs is or the, the the startups is it the big techs um where should we focus to really what are most the, the most effective partners to create in this innovation um, um uh, innovation ecosystems maybe francesca sven i think many of you have something to say on it my i mean it's a long time since we've heard something from you but i think you also have a lot to say on this topic um, regarding this question, I think that uh, depending on the on the industry that you that you want to promote, for example, if we are talking about um, maybe an ICT technology, it's possible to focus uh, our attention on on um, startups. But maybe if you if we are talking about um, um, mobility as a service uh, in a real developing of of electric mobility, maybe for example in Germany, uh, you you have to involve for sure and uh, the big uh, automobile um, companies like Volkswagen like Mercedes I know for example we were um, uh, we were working uh, we were working in um, in Hamburg and there um, there was an involvement of, of uh, Volkswagen another another sector where I think that it's important to involve uh, very um, um, uh, big companies is um, the the sector of energy efficiency for example if you want to to build a, a district heating with it which is a, a very important resource for a city that wants uh, uh, that wants to become uh, energy efficiency for sure you need uh, to involve um, an important civil uh, civil construction uh, engineering company or um, with uh, with um, building retrofitting um, interventions uh, for example in nones um there is there is ng working with the municipality on this issue so um again for me what is important is to understand uh where you want to work uh and then you have to create uh, the value creation ecosystem a real uh, a sp a, a specific for that uh for that intervention i am completely agree with um with the comment that uh, was addressed regarding the the, the the we need to see the strategy i am completely 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 agree many times we are developing projects without a, a whole overview of the city and if you want to create a smart city you have to 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 to, to, to see the city as a as a unique uh, unit okay thank you i think it's when you wanted to mention something Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. I think, again, that we have to come back to the term of the mindset. And uh, Cecile, thank you very much for, uh, for, for um, bringing this uh, on, the, on the table again. Uh, what is not existing is uh, done is better than perfect mindset, uh, especially not in Germany. And I completely agree when we talk about um, technology like nuclear power plants and uh, flying an airplane, then of course I don't want to do any experiments. I want to work, I want to have the technology working. But when it comes to solving emerging problems here in the city, when it comes to the cleanness of air and when it comes to mobility, we need an explorative mindset. We need to um, create a market process uh, a thinking um, that, that, that startups, that initiatives that uh, people can try out and it, that they don't have to um, uh, um, wait for years and um, especially not for corporates, uh, for the big corporates or for the big governments. We need this explorative mindset. And I think whatever, it, whatever we can do to support people trying out, that would be uh, uh, helpful. And maybe, um, Eyal, I don't know if I can uh, ask you, but you have created such a breeding ground for for exploration that is that is terrific yeah. I mean, maybe I, I would like to say some word about it i i i think that the, the idea of mindset and the creating this mindset is, is is very important and i would like to connect it to um a comment uh, here mentioned by uh, falco carl in the chat 
Yeah. Uh, he asked what, what could the role of startup incubators in engaging citizens, entrepreneurs and institutions in co-creating smart city related solutions and, product and prototypes. I think this is very, very important and this is a very good opportunity and we in Israel have a lot of, of uh, experience with it, with uh, all kinds. It's not just incubators, it can be accelerators, it can be all kinds of formats that bring the citizens to and, and support them in developing solutions for their own sake. Um, there was a group of, of ten, uh, uh, ten, 10 groups of, of startups last year. They were supported by the municipality, um, not only money-wise, but also by connecting them to the right people. Mm -hmm. And they created, out of these 10 groups, there are eight real startup created which focus in on, on real problems and, and uh, helping to solve these problems. Uh, they can be very small, small at the beginning, but this is the, the I, I believe this is the very right thing to do. Then this is changing the mindset and this yeah. brings the citizens to be engaged in, in creating solutions for, for their own and creating the, the entire uh, ecosystem of, of smart city, which in, in, in my view, uh, all the thing of, of smart cities is, is, the, um, um, is dealing about the well-being of citizens in cities. So we, yeah. we are trying to improve, to improve well-being. And who knows how to improve or what should be improved than more than, than the citizens themselves. Okay. Great. So we are back again to the public, private, um, and, and, and sit, so the citizen involvement, the four Ps. I mean, Marlin, welcome. You raise your hand. Yes, I, I raise my hand because I think we have very challenging uh, and interesting presentations and uh, different uh, views. And the nice thing with uh, researchers is always that they don't tell what practitioners uh, want to hear and they okay. don't give any solutions. They are good at providing all kinds of uh, problems. So I like also the plea uh, for actions with that. But it, it, I looked at the number of people uh, over here. Huh? It's uh, more than 100. The total one uh, registration was more than 400, two days. When I was making a short calculation, we could have developed with those persons over here between 20 and 40 uh, prototypes uh, for that. That's what I, I would have done. I do it in my lectures in that way, creating uh, all kinds of uh, new uh, insights uh, for that with the uh, students. And that results in a lot of, uh, generates a lot of um, new ideas. And what I do then in my lectures, I invite the public servants also to be judged on the jury on uh, the lectures to give feedback also to the students makes the students very happy often they uh, the, the best one uh, gets also uh, some kind of award uh, uh, even from the public servants it makes the public servants happy because they come back with all kinds of uh, ideas back home and sometimes uh, we uh, also uh, invite the industry in uh, very uh, that to say from oh is this feasible how can it be scaled up or whatever be done so we try also to connect uh, with very simple ways because I'm just talking about uh, uh, lectures huh? from just a module a course I'm managing you can all already start and in involving uh, the the public sector and uh, the people in it what I ask always my students to do it don't try to come back to me without having talked to citizens or customers uh, or whatever you want to do it. If you don't do it, you will not pass a threatening uh, with them and they won't pass without uh, doing it. So they will also ensure that the citizens uh, are heard and their voice is uh, included in uh, that way. So why I'm saying that is we, we have a tendency or the policy makers especially have a tendency to think in terms of very large infrastructures. Eh? We need more money, we need more investment with that, but we have everything in place. I think that's also the discussion about agility uh, we just have. We do have the structures already in place, we just don't use them. We have to make uh, more effective use uh, uh, of them and we have to ensure that they can uh, be yeah, be focused on what we want. So that's what I want to add uh, uh, to this discussion. And I hope that will 
create also some reactions, of course. Speaking of reactions, unfortunately, we only have 10 minutes left, so I would suggest moving on to the last part of uh, our panel today, which is the wrap-up, simply a uh, final round of future statements. Before doing that, I just want to highlight, because it has been mentioned quite a couple of times, talking about the perspective of citizens, um, I encourage you to stay tuned for the report that's going to emanate from all of this endeavor um, that we're doing right now to collect actually the opinion of everyone, including of citizens. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Evelyn, great. maybe too shortly, um, um, we, we got a good question, interesting impulse by Caroline. Mm -hmm. uh, Caroline um, um, the, the role or the possibilities of digital cooperatives as an alternative model. Any of you having already some experiences and some opinion on this? Not yet, so we need to explore that a little bit more in detail. But Caroline, thanks a lot for this suggestion. Okay. And everything, yeah, everything yeah. that's written in the chat for everyone who participated. Of course, we save that information and we use it for the future steps of this uh, of this project. So, great. Before concluding, um, first of all, thank you so much, everyone, for taking uh, part in this in this panel. Uh, we would love, before letting you go, to hear a short statement from all of you. So all the speakers, all the panelists, I'm talking about really two, three sentences because we are short on time. Uh, we're interested in what is it, so what is your foresight of what intersectoral collaboration ideally will look like in smart cities in the future? And I would suggest starting with Margarita, so bottom right, and then simply going from right to left, um, from bottom to up. So Margarita, uh, you're next. Thank you. So, so I envision the smart cities of the future as a place where fruitful interactions take place among stakeholders, uh, where, where entrepreneurial thinking in terms of creating value and um, uh, societal, economic and uh, environmental impact will drive smart city strategies. And of course, every stakeholder should be aware trained and competent in using digital tools and even create their own. Thank you. Thank you. Sven? I think you're muted. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, discussion. I really uh, learned a lot. Thanks to everybody. What I would like to uh, bring on the table is the mindset of uh, experts an explorative mindset, as I said. So the collaboration should be open for an end that we cannot really describe now. It will be an adventure. It will be something that we are not able to define before we start it. So we have to be open. We have to have common values that guide our action, but we are not sure about the end of the process. So. Uh, it, let's discuss about values and let's discuss about an explorative mindset that uh, brings us to uh, a city where, exactly as Margarita said, well, uh, where we live together, where the well-being of the citizens is improved. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ken. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, 2030. Um, ideally, these kind of innovation partnerships uh, put the citizen at the center and <clears throat> actually from their own responsibilities and their own capacities also learn from each other how public sector to be more entrepreneurial, uh, learning from the private sector, but also the private sector being more societally focused, more focused on common goals and sustainable goals, um, <clears throat> learning from the public sector. So that would be my uh, ideal. Thank you so much. Ayel, you would be next. Um, I, I used to distinguish between ecosystem and, and community. I think that the ecosystems uh, exist and are developed in a very natural process. Um, however, communities can be um, uh, get help in order to to function in a in a, in a better way and um, i think that if the ecosystems will act as communities 
and uh, in in the in the uh, you know the the um, very very uh, basic definition of a community. The community has one or two or few targets to, to objective to, to achieve, and if the communities will do some uh, joint projects together, uh, purposely, not just created as as a something that is is created uh, in a natural way, but will find ways to to uh, work on on joint uh, projects then we'll see a big and, and very effective uh, advancement in, in the domain. Thank you so much, Eyal. Given that in five minutes, or more precisely four minutes, we have to go onto the stage, I would really love to hear the, the um, answer from everyone. But please, if you can keep it to two, three sentences, that'd be amazing. Francesc, you would be next. Just uh, one sentence. Uh, one sentence. I think that the uh, public authorities, um, local governments, uh, need to develop a real, real strategies, and they have to uh, set up the conditions for uh, transit to a public sector um, leadership, to a to a co leadership with the private sector in order to ensure a real uh, sustainable development in uh, developing countries, but also in developed uh, countries. Thank you. Ralf Martin? So I hope that in 10 years, uh, when we have next this discussion, we're talking about happy cities, not smart cities, but, uh, but uh, smartphones have already become uh, de facto, and, uh, and smart cities as well are becoming de facto, so we are digitalized. And I think the next key point is to actually put the happiness in the center. And this also comes to the key argument about the problem-based approach uh, and maybe uh, a bit uh, critical towards researchers as myself as well, but maybe we have been too much focused on the definitions and concepts, but in a field of smart city, there are no definitions, no concepts. It's more like a movement. And if you all agree on the kind of a problem-based approach, uh, then we can maybe move towards uh, happier cities. Thank you. Great point, thank you. Cecil, you are next. Well, I think that uh, it, smart city will deliver if everyone is doing its part well. Uh, I don't think um, local governments have to be a child. They have to have a long-term vision. Companies have to be a child. Citizens have to be um, consistent between their consuming hat and their citizen hat. And to, uh, if they want some results, they have to, to move on the boat. And as for academics, I, I should say that they are doing their part, but with one part they are not playing enough. They are not entering enough the public debate on those issues. And they have to go into the political arena and to be the figure of the intellectual. Great. Ferdinand? I agree with uh, Sven Ripsas that um, smart city uh, or moving towards a smart city means uh, traveling into the unknown. But with government as a referee, that would be uh, my demand. And um, the final test will be twofold. One, uh, we have to ensure sustainability. The zero emission um, uh, balance will be the ultimate test in this respect. And the other, other test is it is less about technology, but about people. The ultimate question is, do we want to live in this smart city? Thank you so much. Last but not least, Martin. Thank you. To add uh, to the previous uh, people, we have everything. Eh? We have the human resources, we have local sensors, we have the infrastructure, but we are not smart enough to use them. That's why I like also the uh, what you call the uh, co-op uh, in the chats uh, uh, with that, because we need to make use of them. So I hope we will become smart in the future. So use what we have. Thank you, everyone, for taking part in this panel. It was great. We learned a lot, lots of different perspectives. I would now encourage you to go to uh, the stage, and we have the wrap-up and the preview starting in a few seconds. So thank you very much, and see you there.